डियर फ्रेंड्स जय भीम नमो बुधाय आई एम रीडिंग दिस चैप्टर कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ निबान ऑन द टॉपिक ए वे टू निबान और इन संस्कृत इट इज कॉल्ड एज निर्वाण फ्रॉम दिस बुक बाय वेनरेबल नारथ द बुक्स नेम इज द वे टू निबान रिटर्न बाय वेनरेबल नारथ है पब्लिश बाय बुद्धिस्ट कल्चर सेंटर आई हैव ऑलरेडी रेड सो मैनी चैप्टर्स एंड मेड सो मैनी वीडियोज ऑफ about this book about the concept of nibban and now i am going to wrap up this almost it is the last chapter which i am going to read characteristics of nibban <coughs> what is nibban friend what is nibban friend the destruction of lust the destruction of hatred the destruction of delusion that friend is called nibban it is taken from sanyukta nikay in contra distinction of sansar the phenomenal existence nibban is eternal desirable and happy according to buddhism all things mundane and supra mundane are classified into two divisions namely those coined by causes and those not conditioned by any cause these three are the features of all conditioned things aspiring cessation and change of state aspiring cessation and change of state these are three features of all conditioned things arising or becoming is an essential characteristic of everything that is conditioned by a cause or causes that which arises or becomes is subjected to change and dilution and dissolution every conditioned thing is constantly becoming and is perpetually changing the universal law of change applies to everything in the cosmos both mental and physical ranging from the minutest germ or tiniest tiniest particle to the height being or the most massive object mind though imperceptible changes faster even than matter nibban a super mundane state realized by buddhas and arhats are declared to be not conditioned by any cause hence it is not subjected to any becoming change and dissolution it is birthless decayless and deathless strictly speaking nibban is neither a cause nor an effect hence it is unique everything that has sprung from a cause must inevitably pass away and as such is undesirable life is man's dearest possession but when he is confronted with ins- insuperable difficulties and unbearable burdens then that very effect becomes an intolerable burden sometimes he tries to seek relief by putting an end to his life as if suicide would solve all his individual problems bodies are adorned and adored but those charming adorable and extinct and enticing forms when disfigured by time and disease become extremely repulsive men desire to live peacefully and happily with their near ones surrounded by amusements and pleasures but if by some misfortune the wicked world runs counter to their ambitions and desires the inevitable sorrow is then almost indescribable indescribably sharp the following beautiful parable aptly illustrates the fleeting nature of life and its alluring pleasures A man was forcing his way through a thick forest beset with thorns and stones suddenly to his great consternation or his suddenly to his great surprise an elephant appeared and gave chase he took to his heels through fear and seeing a well he ran to hide in it but to his horror he saw a viper at the bottom of the well however lacking other means of escape he jumped into the well and clung to a thorny creepy that was growing in it 
looking at he saw two mice a white and a black one gnawing at the creeper over his face there was a behave from which occasional drops of honey trickled this man foolishly unmindful of his precarious position was greedily tasting the honey a kind person volunteered to show him a path of escape but the greedy man begged to be excused till he had enjoyed himself the thorny path is sansar have you understand that this man was in a position that uh, he was in the ground there was one dangerous person on the in the well there was a dangerous person on the ground there was a dangerous animal animal vipers and he was totally in between lot of uh, problems but he tried to taste he he chose to rather taste that honey rather than uh, taking help of the other man the thorny part the, the 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 this foolish man unmindful of his precarious position was greedily tasting the honey a kind person volunteered to show him a path to escape but the greedy man begged to to be excused till he had enjoyed itself himself the thro the thorny path is sansar the ocean of life man's life is not a bed of roses it is beset with difficulties and obstacles to overcome with opposition and unjust criticism with attacks and insults to be borne such is the thorny path of life the elephant here resembles death the viper old age and the creeper birth the two mice night and day the drops of honey correspond to the fleeting sensual pleasures the kind man is the buddh the so called material happiness is merely the gratification of sub desire when the desire desired thing is gained another desire arises insatiate or increasingly which increase sudden increase are all desires sorrow is essential sorrow is essential to life and cannot be evaded nibban being non contradiction is eternal desirable eternal desirable and happy the happiness of nibban should be differentiated from ordinary worldly happiness nibbanic bliss grows neither stale nor monotonous it is a form of happiness that never varies never fluctuates it arises by allying passions unlike the temporary worldly happiness which results from the gratification of some desire in the bhu vedaniya sutta bahu vedaniya bahu vedaniya sutta the buddh enumerates 10 grades of happiness beginning with the gross material pleasures which results from the pleasant pleasant stimulation of the senses as one ascends higher and higher in the moral plane the type of happiness becomes ever more exalted sublime and subtle so much so that the world scarce scarcely recognizes it as happiness in the just in the first jhana or dhyana in the first jhana one experiences a transcendental happiness or sukh absolutely independent of the five senses this happiness is realized by inhibiting the desire for the pleasure of the senses highly prized by the materials materialists in the fourth jhana however even this type of happiness is discarded as coarse and unprofitable and equanimity or upekha is termed equanimity is the stable state of a mental stable mental state of emotions and thoughts equanimity or upekha is termed happiness the buddh says five fold anand are sensual bonds what are the five forms cognizable by the eye desirable lovely charming infatuating accompanied by thirst and arousing the dust of the passion sounds cognizable by the ear odors cognizable by the nose favors cognizable by the tongue contacts cognizable by the body desirable lovely charming infatuating accompanied by thirst 
and arousing the dust of passion. These anand are the five sensual bonds. Whatever happiness or pleasure arises from these sensual bonds is known as sensual happiness. Whoso should declare, this is the highest happiness and pleasure which beings may experience. I do not grant him. And why? Because there is other happiness more exalted and sublime. And what is that other happiness more exalted and sublime? Here a bhikkhu leaves completely separated from sense desires, remote from immortal, remote from immoral state, with initial and sustained application, born of seclusion, in joy and happiness, abiding in the first ecstasy or pratham jhan. This is happiness more exalted and sublime. But should anyone declare? This is the highest happiness and pleasure which being, beings may experience. I do not grant him that. And why? Because there is another happiness, yet more exalted and sublime. Here a bhikkhu, stilling initial and sustained application, having tranquility within mind, uh, having tranquility within mind, predominating initial and sustained application, having ceased initial and sustained application having ceased as a result of peace leaves in joy and happiness abiding in the second ecstasy or dhritya jhana this is the other happiness more exalted and sublime remember this jhana for indians it is dhyan jhana jhana is a pali word yet should anyone declare that this is the highest happiness and pleasure experienced by beings i do not grant it there is happiness more exalted here a bhikkhu from absence of desire for joy abides serene, mindful and completely conscious, experiencing in the body that of which the Aryas says, endowed with equanimity and mindfulness, he abides in bliss, thus he leaves abiding in the third ecstasy, that is Tritya Jhana. This is the other happiness and pleasure, more exalted and sublime. Still. Should anyone declare that this is the highest happiness? I do not grant it. There is happiness more exalted. Where a bhikkhu abandoning pleasure and pain, leaving behind former joy and grief, painless, pleasureless, perfect in equanimity and mindfulness, leaves abiding in the fourth jhana. In the fourth ecstasy, ecstasy that is chatuth, chatuth jhana. This is the other happiness more exalted and sublime. However, however, where this declared to be the highest happiness, I do not grant it. There is happiness most, more sublime. Here a bhikkhu passing entirely beyond the perception of form with the disappearance of sense reaction, freed from attention to perceptions of diversity things infinitely is space and leaves abiding in the realm of infinite space. This other happiness is more exalted and sublime. Nevertheless, if this were declared the highest happiness, I do not grant it. There is happiness more, happiness more sublime. Here we co transcending entirely the realm of infinite space. Thinks infinite is consciousness and leaves abiding in the realm of infinite consciousness. This other happiness is more exalted and sublime. And yet, should this be declared the highest happiness? I do not grant it. There is higher happiness. Here, a bhikkhu transcending the realm of infinite consciousness thinks there is nothing whatsoever and leaves abiding in the realm of nothingness. This other happiness is more exalted and, and sublime than that. And still, where this declared the highest happiness? I do not grant it. There is happiness more exalted. Here a bhikkhu, passing entirely beyond the realm of nothingness, leaves abiding in the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. This other happiness is more exalted and sublime. Yet whoso should declare this is the highest bliss and pleasure which beings may experience, I do not grant him that. And why? Because yet another happiness is more exalted and sublime. And what is this other happiness, more exalted and sublime? Here is a bhikkhu utterly transcending the realm of neither perception nor non-perception leaves 
having attained to the cessation of perception and sensation. This anand is the other happiness more exalted and sublime. Of all the ten grades of happiness, this is the highest and the most sublime. This transcendental, transcendental state is nirodh sampati, that is, experiencing nibbana in this life itself. As the Buddha himself has anticipated, one may ask, how can that state be called highest happiness when there is no consciousness to experience it? The Buddha replies, Nay, disciples, the Gathagat does not recognize bliss merely because of a pleasurable sensation. But disciples, wherever bliss is attained, there and there only does the accomplished one recognize bliss. I proclaim, says the Buddha, that everything experienced by the sense is sorrow. But why? Because one in sorrow craves to be happy and the so-called happy crave to be happier still. So insatiate is worldly happiness. Insatiate means increasing is the worldly happiness. In conventional terms, the Buddha declares Nibbanam, Nibbanam, Paramam, Sukham. Nibban is the highest bliss. It is bliss supreme because it is not a kind of happiness experienced by the sense. It is a bliss. It is a blissful state of positive relief from the ills of life. The very fact of the cessation of suffering is ordinarily termed happiness, though this is not an appropriate word to depict its real nature. Where is Nibban? In the Milinpana, the vulnerable knocks and answers this question thus. There is not, there is no spot looking east, south, west or north, above, below or beyond where Nibban is situated and yet Nibban is. And he who orders his life, all right, ground it in virtue and with rational attention may realize it whether he lives in Greece, China, Alexandria or in Kosal. Just as fire is not stored up in any particular place but arises when the necessary conditions exist, so Nibban is said not to exist in a particular place but it is attained when the necessary conditions are fulfilled. In the Rohitas Sutta, Rohitas, Rohitas Sutta the Buddha states in this very one phantom long body, along with the perceptions and thoughts, do I proclaim the world, the origin of the world, the cessation of the world and the path leading to the cessation of the world? Here world means suffering, the cessation of the world therefore means cessation of suffering which is Nibban. Once Nibban is dependent upon this one fathom body, it is not something that is created, nor is it something to be created. Nibban is there where the four elements of cohesion, extenso, heat and motion find no footing. Referring to where Nibban is, Samyutta Nikai states, where the fourth elements that claves and stretch and burn and move no further footing find. In the Uddan, the Buddha says, Just as Obikus, notwithstanding those rivers that reach the great ocean and the torrents of rain that fall from the sky, neither a deficit nor a surplus is perceptible in the great ocean. Even so, despite the many Bikus that enter the remainderless Parinipan, there is neither a deficit nor a surplus in the element of Nipan. Nibban is therefore not a kind of heaven where a transcendental ego resides, but a dham, an attainment, which is within the reach of us all. An eternal heaven which provides all forms of pleasures desired by man and where one enjoys happiness to one's heart's content is practically inconceivable. It is absolutely impossible to think that such a people could exist permanently anywhere. Granting that there is no place where Nibban is stored up, King Milind 
questions vulnerable knocks and whether there is any place where on a man stand and ordering his life all right realize nibban yes o king there is such a place there is such a basis which then vulnerable knocks and is that basis virtue o king it is that basis for if grounded in virtue and careful in attention whether in the land of the scythians or the greeks whether in china or in tractre that is around europe whether in alexandria or in nikumb whether in banaras or in kosal whether in kashmir or in gandhar that is kandhar whether on a mountain top or in the highest heavens whether he may be the man who orders his life all right will attain nibban what attains nibban this question must necessarily be set aside as irrelevant for buddhism denies the existence of a permanent entity or an immortal soul the so called being of which we often hear as the vestment of the soul is a mere bundle of conditioned factors the arhat bikuni vajira says and just when the parts are rightly set the work chariot arises in our mind so doth or usage covenant to say as being when the aggregates are there according to buddhism the so called being con- being consist of mind and matter that is naam and roop which constantly constantly change the lightning rapidity apart from these two composite factors there exists no permanent f- soul or an unchanging entity the so called i is also an illusion instead of an eternal soul or an illusory i buddhism possesses a dynamic life flux which both and inf- which both ad infinitum as long as it is fed with ignorance and craving when these two roots causes are eradicated are eradicated by any individual or attainment or on any individual on attaining arhatship they cease to flow with his final death in conventional terms one says that the arhat has attained parinibbana or passed away into nibbana as right now here there is neither a permanent ego nor an identical being it is needless to state that there can be no i or a soul at atma or a soul in nibbana the visuddhi mark states misery only doth exist none miserable nor doer is there not save the deed is found nibbana is but not the man who seeks it the path exists but not the traveler on it the chief difference between the buddhist conception of nibbana and the hindu conception of nibbana or mukti lies in the fact that buddhists view their goal without an eternal soul and creator while hindus do believe in an eternal soul and a creator this is the reason why buddhism can neither be called eternalism or nihilism i would like to explain this what is eternalism and nihilism eternalism is a philosophical approach to the ontological nature of time which takes the view that all points in time are equally real as opposed to the persistent idea that only the present is real ontology is the philosophical study of the nature of being becoming existence or relating as well as basic categories of being and their relations nihilism is the philosophical doctrine suggesting the negation of one or more putatively meaningful aspect of life most common in nihilism is presented in the form of existential nihilism which argues that life is without objective meaning purpose or instinctic value there is this is the reason why buddhism can neither be called an eternalism or nihilism in nibbana nothing is eternalized nor is anything annihilated as sir edwin arnold says if any teach nibbana is to cease say unto such they lie if any teach nibbana is to live say unto such they are it must be admitted that the question of nibbana is the most difficult in the teaching of the buddha however much we may speculate we shall never be 
in a position to comprehend its real nature the best way to understand nibbana is to try to realize it with our own intuitive knowledge although nibbana cannot be perceived by the five senses and lies in obs obscurity in so far as the average man is concerned the only straight path that leads to nibbana has been explained by the buddha with all the necessary details and is let open to all the goal is now clouded but the method of achievement is perfectly clear and when the achievement is realized the goal is as clear as the moon freed from clouds this is a small poem i vow that when my life approaches its end all obstructions will be swept away i will see amitabh buddh and be born in his land of ultimate bliss when reborn in the western land i will be perf perfect and completely willful without exception these great woes to delight and benefit all beings the woes of samanth bhadra avat masak sutta so i was reading this is the end of this book the way to nibbana by venerable narathera end of the concept of nibbana or nirvana or in insight so i have already said that uh, this is for monks but as a layman you can also as a layman as a lay buddhist you can also uh, listen and try to understand try to follow some some of the aspects and virtues which are explained in the book thank you very much we will meet again uh, with uh, another topic jai bhim navodhaya